<clears throat> this is October 9th, 2022, and uh, before we get to the uh, koan I'll be commenting on today, just a, uh, a little something that has come up uh, in the three weeks since I gave the Te Show, where I talked about my departure this year, uh, I've learned with, from... Uh, mostly from seeing people in Doksan who had who had questions or concerns, I've learned that um, a lot of a lot of people didn't hear that Tay show. Um, I, it makes me wonder how many Tay shows anyone hears uh, who's not in the room when they're given. Um, but I just want to encourage people. I mean, I I don't know. How eager I'd be to hear my own taste shows, but <laughs> but aside from that, uh, that, every once in a while there can be a, a, some little nugget that can help you in your practice. But in particular, this one of I think it's September 18th. I think, yeah, September 18th, about three weeks ago. Um, I really go talk at some length about all the different aspects of uh, my uh, this being my last full year here in Rochester and and. Uh, uh, of course, the koan I comment on there is about uh, Dharma transmission, about a new teacher. And so it's it's right in the middle of everything that's going on now. So, yeah, give it a shot if you have nothing better to do. Maybe if you're in heavy traffic and you don't... <laughs> <laughs> but uh, today, uh, I'm going to take up a koan uh, that involves Lin Chi, the great Lin Chi, the Rinzai. And this is number 13 in the Shoyo Roku. It's the Book of Serenity, sometimes translated as the Book of Equanimity. Uh, and here's how it goes. When Lin Ji was about to die, he entrusted Sansheng with his Dharma line, saying, After my passing, do not destroy my treasury of the eye of the Dharma. Sansheng asked, How would I dare destroy your treasury of the eye of the Dharma? Then Lin Chi, If someone asks you about it, how will you respond? Sansheng shouted. And then Lin Chi ends by saying, Who would have known that my treasury of the eye of the Dharma would perish in this blind donkey? I do have some some uh, information here about uh, Lin Chi. Uh, there's not a lot actually. He he was born in around the year 800, which would explain why there's not a lot of biographical information, but less than other masters of his stature. Uh, I'm reading now from a book called get the official title: The Record of Lin Chi. Uh, record is a term uh, that uh, often in Zen refers to the, the teachings of Lin Chi and, and also the life. But this is a monumental book, thick, four or five hundred pages, um, the record of Lin Chi. And it was, uh, uh, it's drawn from the historical records, but the translation and commentary are by Ruth Fuller Sasaki, she was one of the pioneers of Zen, uh, Zen books, and is edited by Thomas Yuho Kirchner, who uh, I know that um, John Sensei and Chris met him in, uh, when they were in Japan. Uh, I'm just going to kind of get to the, the, the gist of this, his biography. Uh, for the first few years after he joined Huang Bo's assembly, so uh, uh, this Japanese name Obaku, uh, after he joined the great Huang Bo's assembly, Lin Chi seems to have attracted little attention, which is surprising given what kind of a fire breather he became after his enlightenment. During this time, therefore, we may imagine him devoting himself diligently and wholeheartedly to meditation. And 
and other such activities as were participated in by the students surrounding Huang Bo. By the way, uh, as is so commonly the case, before Lin Chi ever found his way to the great Huang Bo, he uh, achieved some mastery in the Vinaya school, that's the the uh, Buddhist precepts, monastic precepts, and uh, also in sutra study. So this was step three. Uh, this period of, sep- of preparation uh, specifically states lasted three years and was brought to a close by Lynchy's Great Enlightenment. And according to the records, uh, at the suggestion of the head monk of Huang Bo's temple, there again that importance of the head monk, Lin Chi three times questioned Huang Bo on the cardinal meaning of the Buddha Dharma, and three times he was struck by him. Lin Chi, uh, rather than taking a burn to this and um, uh, suing Lin Chi for <laughs> physical abuse. He apologized for his inability to grasp the meaning of the master's blows, and uh, Lin Chi prepared to leave the temple. He must have been uh, discouraged. But then, then uh, Wang Bo urged him to visit a monk named Da Yu, who he said would explain everything to him. So Lin Chi went to see Da Yu, and after they had an exchange of a few words, um, he attained enlightenment. And then he went back to Huang Bo, and he recounted what had taken place. The author here, Ruth Fuller Sasaki, says, In a spirited encounter with the master, Lin Chi slapped Huang Bo's face. And then the master said, You lunatic, coming back here and pulling the tiger's whiskers. To which Lin Chi responded with a roaring shout, which from that time on was associated with his name and style of Zen. After after this, he resumed his place in Huang Bo's assembly. A little more than here. Uh, this is yeah. Now this is just a different version, but it's also interesting. Um, Lin Chi went to visit this Da Yu, who lived in a hermitage not far away. Uh, and then in that first meeting, Lin, Lin Chi attempted to impress the old monk by discoursing all night on various Buddhist sutras and doctrines. Again, his, how well-versed he was in the sutras. At dawn, Dayu, who had listened in silence throughout the night, that's pretty amazing, <laughs> uh, berated the young monk and pushed him out the door. Everyone has his limits. <laughs> When Lin Chi returned and reported to Huang Bo on his visit, he was reprimanded for not having made better use of the opportunity. He then set off to visit Dai Yu again, so he went back to Dai Yu. Again, he was scolded and driven out of the door, but this time he returned, Lin Chi returned to Huang Bo, convinced that he had achieved understanding. Uh, some ten days later, he went once more to see Dai Yu, and he, this time he was anticipating the old monk's efforts to drive him away by knocking him down and beating him. Wait. Um, yeah, he, the Lin Shi knocked him down and, and beat him. Uh, and then Dai Yu acknowledged Lin Shi as his disciple. No one needs to take this kind of behavior as literally. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but it may have been. Uh, 
at about the age of 40, after uh, some 10 or 12 years after his enlightenment, uh, he left and set out on a pilgrimage. Yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. We have too much uh, other material here. Imagine that uh, this was this was more than this was some twelve hundred years ago. How how many of us will anyone ever hear about in twelve hundred years? So back to the koan. When Lin Chi was about to die. He entrusted Sansheng with his Dharma line. Uh, Sansheng uh, appears in a koan in the Blue Cliff record where he storms in to see Seppo, the great Seppo, and he said, The golden carp has escaped from the net. What will it feed on? And uh, Seppo responded, uh, Well, when you're out of the net, I'll let you know. Um, good comeback, but not good enough for for San Sheng. He said, well, the, this master of 1,200 monks can't come up with a better reply than that. And uh, to which Seppo responded, my duties as abbot are many and complicated. And don't think that he's apologizing for his response. One of the points of the koan. So he's about to die, and he gives Dharma transmission to this Sang Sheng, and then said, After my passing, do not destroy my treasury of the eye of the Dharma. Another translation has it, my true do not destroy my true Dharma eye. The, uh, the editor of the book I was just reading from, uh, The Record of Lin Chi, said that uh, this true Dharma I is just a way of referring to the basic principles of the Dharma, the Buddhism. Uh, it could be taken in a more narrow sense of Lin Chi saying, don't destroy my teaching, my teaching, instead of the Dharma, my teaching. Because the Dharma is means both in a way it means the bigger the bigger meaning of Dharma is the truth, the way, the law, ultimate reality that's Dharma um, then the the narrower understanding of it is the te- teaching um, my teaching. So, which did Lin Chi mean, and and which how did which way did Sun Sheng take it? In any case, Sun Sheng replies, "How would I dare destroy your treasury of the eye of the Dharma?" That's an um, important, very important point of the koan. How could I destroy the Dharma? When the, when the, when destruction itself is the Dharma, there's nothing, nothing outside the Dharma.
endings of any kind, death, retirement, it's all the Dharma. This koan, as I delved into it uh, again uh, this this yesterday and the day before, came to see that it's really all about destruction and creation. Uh, And I fished out this article from quite a while ago, 1988, uh, by a uh, Philip Novak. Uh, Philip Novak was the co-author of a wonderful introduction to uh, Buddhism in general. It's just it's just called Buddhism. It's Philip Novak and uh, um, Houston, Smith. Houston Smith. Thank you, Houston Smith. Um, if anyone wants it to be pointed to a very nice, clear, simple introduction to. To, uh, to Zen Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism, Theravada Buddhism. Uh, this, is, this is a really good one called Buddhism. But here, this was before, I'm sure this was before that book came out. And, um, and this Philip Novak is a, uh, a PhD, is, uh, at, at the time, 1988, was associate professor in the Department of Philosophy at Dominican College in San Rafael, California, and this this article was delivered at a conference convened by a Sri Lankan Buddhist scholar, Padma Siri da Silva. But uh, I turn to this because uh, he has an uh, an eloquence, and certainly in written in in the written language uh, that uh, we can only have to admire in a, in a scholar. And so, uh, to make it easier on those of you listening to the Tesha, I'm just going to read uh, some of this. He says, he talks first about the uh, uh, a big central feature is of, of Zen practice is disidentifying with a self. It's quite a task, uh, especially uh, today in contemporary uh, in the United States, where uh, identity is uh, the obsession of so many people, whether it's uh, racial identity, sexual identity, uh, um, national identity, tribal identity, and then then he goes on to say. Um, We are all aware that Buddhist practice is a means to eradicate false views of the nature of the self, and as such, it is primarily a destructive opus. It destroys the hindrances. It dissolves the three poisons. It reveals the non-self characteristic of reality. So this is a this is a, a key aspect of especially in Zen, uh, we were often quoted the Zen saying it's a practice of daily losing. Um, it's a practice of of deconstructing this illusory self that we cling to. It's uh, The the when when uh, Lynchy here as it is here says do not destroy my treasury of the eye of the Dharma. Uh, he couldn't have said that 
seriously because he knows he knows that no one, Sanchung or even he himself, could possibly destroy it. That uh, there's no there's nobody there to effect such an act of destruction. It's no self. It's way beyond what anyone can do. I, uh, I remember taking heart at this when uh, when Roshi left me in charge of the center and t- reminding myself that I, I, I'm not going to destroy the Dharma. <laughs> Maybe the center, but not the Dharma. <laughs> So, so this is a, a challenge. This is a test by uh, Lin Chi, of course, throwing that out. He knows, he knows he can't do such a thing. Uh, Lin Chi is hardly worried about it. And then, then Novak goes on, but the hunger for identity does not vanish overnight nor does one go from being bound up in identity clinging to being free of such a clinging in a day. The Buddhist path is a developmental one, and I want to suggest that Buddhism must offer interim identities to the aspirant, so that as old, inauthentic self-images fall away, more authentic ones take their place as progress is made toward final liberation. So we can pose the question, okay, who 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 am I? Who who am I before who was I, let's say, who was I before I was a man? Who was I uh, before I was Caucasian? Uh who was I um before my parents gave birth to me. This is the identity that is a no identity, that this true self that is no self, that is the focus of Zen practice, to see through all these, uh, what, what he calls these, these provisional or these interim identities that psychologically can be useful to, to work through. Yes, yes, it can be. This tribal identities to to identify with a group with a country with a with a race with a gender and so forth but let us never forget that the work the real work the essential work of zen practice is to see through all that and yet as novak i think very wisely notes uh, we need to have something uh, in the meantime before we have thoroughly seen this true self that is no self, we can use as a kind of skillful means these other things. He goes on, Buddhist practice, I am suggesting, has a constructive aspect that satisfies the human hunger for identity even while the causes of that hunger are being gradually eroded. Back to the destructive, deconstructive nature of Zen practice, I'm going to skip forward to Sansheng's Response: Where when Linji pushes back, Sancheng says, "How would I dare destroy your treasure, the other Dharma?" And Linji uh, must have felt that okay, that was a pretty good response. But let's 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 see how far it goes. And so he says, "If someone asks you about it, how will you respond?" In other words, okay, what more have you got for me? What do you mean by that? To which Sancheng shouted, and uh, I'm I'm going to come out on a limb here and suggest that he shouted, "Quats!" Doesn't say that, but we know he didn't shout. Hi, hey, how's it going? 
maybe he did, but uh, based on our tradition and other koans where this quats comes up, I'm guessing it was quats. Now, what is quats? It became a kind of a convention uh, in Zen stories, dialogues, koans, of, 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 of conveying a sweeping away of everything. Whoosh! Nuking everything. This in one, one utterance, Sancheng goes right to the, the essence of Zen practice. The essence being the, the realm of no thingness, nothing left. The old uh, saying in Zen, kill the Buddha. Even the Buddha can be attacked. Kill enlightenment. That can become an attachment. Every step of the way, the ego can, can utilize something or other to, to, that we can, to get us to, to, to grasp at something new. Uh, even, uh, even, even, even especially uh, attainment having come to awakening, koan after koan after koan uh, enjoins us to discard what we have, think we have attained, as if we could attain anything, really. When, when, when from the very beginning, all beings are Buddha, when the very beginning we have everything we could possibly need, we are whole and complete, endowed with wisdom and compassion, In a koan, I think number 22 in the Mumukana, Ananda, who still had, had yet to come to any awakening, uh, even though he was, you know, BFFs with the Buddha, uh, he said, came to the Buddha and uh, he said, uh, what, uh, what, what, is there anything else? What, 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 what more can I do? Something like that. That's not the exact words. And, uh, the Buddha, the Buddha said, "Ananda." Ananda said, "Yes, yes. This is the, according to Zen lore, which uh, I wouldn't try to push on a historian. According to Zen lore, um, this was the occasion of Ananda's enlightenment. Oh, excuse me. Ananda went to Mahakashapa." The Buddha had already died. Mahakashapa went to Mahakashapa, and Mahakashapa said, Ananda. And at that, uh, Ananda came to awakening, according to the story. And then Mahakashapa said, Now knock down the flagpole at the monastery gate. Destruction, deconstruction, negating. This is what a, a teacher is, is, is doing in Doksan all the time with people who present their understanding of a koan. That's it. Not yet. Ringing people out. Not yet. And it's what we do, especially people uh, working on a koan, it's what, what is done with the questioning. The questioning is an emptying. This is this is commonly in Zen texts referred to as the great doubt, the wondering, because if we're if we are are to the degree that we are really questioning or wondering, uh, then we are free of anything. We are we are losing that wonderful losing. We're letting go. We're allowing uh, disillusion to happen, dissolving of our attachments. Uh, 
Lynch himself was famously said uh, when he's talking about killing, 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 kill, kill mother and father. This can sound so cold and remorseless and so forbidding these this kind of words, but but the point is that it's a natural part of the Dharma. Life is the destruction side, the dying, the ending. It's even embodied in the, the Bodhisattva Manjusri, uh, this delusion cutting sword, which Basui, Japanese Zen Master Basui, put very, very simply cut, 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 cut. Cut identity, cut opinions, cut views. Starting with and all of those, <clears throat> what they all have in common is thoughts. It's thoughts that kill us, in a very real sense. It's thoughts that uh, leave us only half alive. Mu, the word mu, commonly translated as no or not. Um, the one I prefers, I ran across was uh, is the mu means it's not what you think. Does even a dog have Buddha nature? It's not what you think. Whatever you're thinking, it's not it. Chinese master Fai Yan, uh, saying it does not come from thought. And the Buddha himself, not this, not that. Questioning or doubt, uh, let's make it let's say doubt, uh, is it's just the the flip side of faith, and that's the other side of all this is the the constructive, uh, the affirmative, the creative side <laughs> of of Zen practice. A little more of uh, Philip Novak. Well, I, I read this. I, I'm suggesting Buddhist, Buddhist practice has a constructive aspect that satisfies the human hunger for identity. And not just identity, but our, hum, our humanness. Uh, uh, we, we, to, to just teach emptiness, no thingness, killing, is that can't be the whole picture and no no would no zen teacher would ever claim that it is uh earlier in the article I didn't read this he talked about there's there's um he, he said that and identity is sought not only in self assertive modes that this is this is my race or gender or tribe, or, but also in self subordinative ones, and by that he means we le- we learn to link ourselves to structures of power and significance outside ourselves, in whose larger life and identity we can share. Cultural idols, uh, and by that he says he means conditioned realities to which we look for unconditioned meaning. Cultural idols provide temporary refuge for the significance-seeking self. We want a share of the immortality and secure identity they seem to promise. 
He goes on, implicit in the Buddhist aspirant's embrace of the path as that alone which may be able to satisfy her heart's longing is the understanding of the unsatisfactoriness, inauthenticity, and insufficiency of many of these cultural idols. Basically, everything we're surrounded with uh, on the internet and not on the internet. But this does not mean that as soon as one has dharmic intent, that one is suddenly free of the deeply ingrained reflex to create idols, to link oneself to superior powers in one's quest for identity. Nor does, Bu- nor does Buddha- Buddhism wish it so. Behold, it too offers refuge for the significant seeking self, three of them in fact, the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. What a rich field in which to assume a new identity. The aspirant's very will is fueled by images of personal greatness and nobility. I want to be an enlightened one. I want to join the holy company of arhats, enlightened ones. I want to be a bodhisattva and give my life for the liberation of all sentient beings. It is precisely such notions that form the nucleus of a general intentionality that will continue to exert a positive, constructive influence in the aspirant's life. For by weaning oneself away from the individualistic identity images afforded by culture toward more archetypal and transpersonal ones, the Buddhist taps rich sources of psychic energy and inspiration. Buddhism understands that the ongoing health of the personality depends upon sufficient self-esteem. The wearing of robes, the chanting of sutras, the taking of vows, wonderful upaya, all of it. Upaya means skillful means. As old images of who one is fall away, these new identities sustain one. A bodhisattva is a nice thing to be. <laughs> so, as for the, these, these constructive, creative, affirmative, uh, aspirational aspects of Zen practice, uh, in, in, in uh, contrast to the, all of the destruction and purging and so forth, we have... He mentions the four, the uh, three uh, treasures, Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. These, uh, these are the, arguably the three most important of the 16 precepts that we take at Jukai, which is coming up next month. Jukai, taking the precepts. The big ones are the three treasures. But then the four vows, which we do every single day here in this Zendo, at least once a day. All beings without number, I vow to liberate. This here is is the other side of, sometimes in a sutra you hear the Buddha saying, "There there are no beings to liberate. No, that's the emptiness side. That's half the one side of the coin. The other is we need to reach out and serve and help, respond to those in need. All beings without number, we vow to liberate. Endless blind passions, I vow to uproot or see through. The great way of Buddha, I vow to attain. Buddhas and bodhisattvas, So we have figures of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, pictures to that we can find resonance with with our own Buddha and Bodhisattva nature. Faith. This is the this is the faith side of the coin. There's the doubt, emptying, emptying, cutting, killing, and there's the faith, the the affirming. And then also the ten paramitas. Usually uh, 
when we talk about the paramitas or perfections, we talk about the six paramitas. Um, there are, f well, let me just run through these. Uh, there are ten, the fuller thing, but the first six you, will, of course, I'll remember. The first one is dana or giving. That's pretty positive, pretty affirmative. Sheila is uh, morality, the precepts. Uh, Kashanti is patience or forbearance. All things to aspire to. Virya or zeal. Uh, dhyana is meditation. Prajna is wisdom. And then the other four, uh, I think, are even more clearly, well, maybe not, but they're also very positive. As Upaya, he mentioned Upaya. Uh, means uh, literally means suited to the place or situation, skillful means, adapting uh, one's understanding of the Dharma to help others. There's uh, the uh, arising of bodhicitta, that, that aspiration to come to awakening for the sake of all beings. That's the eighth. The ninth is uh, it's called bala. I never heard of it before. Bala paramita, it's spiritual power spiritual or moral power or force. Uh, this this is, uh, I think, what they're talking about in Chinese texts where the translation says virtue. Uh, even in our own English dictionary, uh, this is the second definition. We associate it with being good, but the second definition of virtue is uh, effective moral power or force. And then the tenth of the ten paramitas or perfections is uh, uh, generally translated as uh, knowledge. It's, it's uh, jnana. Um, and then there's the Noble Eightfold Path. Talk about positive, aspirational things. Right understanding, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Notice that mindfulness is just one of eight. You would think from reading uh, magazines and articles everywhere that mindfulness is the, the ultimate of, of, of the Dharma, Buddhist teaching. It's one of eight. The one after it is, I think... Uh, Zen puts just as much emphasis on it, maybe not more, but just as much concentration. We need both. Zen meditation is sort of the, the fusing of mindfulness and concentration. In, in trying to concentrate single-mindedly on the breath or the koan, we have to be mindful when the, of when the mind has wandered. We have to notice, in other words. So mindfulness is right there. Uh, very, very much required for Zen meditation. But beyond that, concentration, seeing through, seeing into and seeing through. There's a great other koan. This is in the last one in the Mumon Khan, where this 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 interplay and this simultaneous um, interaction of the of the the destroying or the negative, the deconstructing with the positive, the affirmative, the yin and yang. Really, what we're talking about is yin and yang. Very much more common kind of way of referring to it where uh, uh, in the commentary, I won't go through the whole thing, just in the commentary, uh, Mumon says, one goes to the bottom of the deep sea and raises a cloud of sand and dust. The other goes to the top of a towering mountain and raises foaming waves that touch the sky. The one holds, the other lets go. There it is, the holding, the positive. The other lets go, the cutting, the losing, the emptying, and each using only one hand sustains the Dharma. 
It's like two children who come running from opposite directions and crash into each other. So this quats. Demolish it. Demolish all thoughts, views, opinions, identities. Demolish the very idea of, of the Dharma as something that could be destroyed. All ideas, concepts, attachments. Attachments above all. Never forget, attachments means above all to our thoughts, our mental attachments. People so often, I just say this over and over because so often beginners especially say, oh, if I have to give up all my attachments, I, I, I got to give up coffee, I got to give up this, <laughs> I got to give up that. No, start with the thoughts. That's, that's When you're done with that, yeah. <laughs> do what you want with the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> or in my case, movies. And then Lin Chi, who would have known that my treasury of the eye of the Dharma would perish in this blind donkey? And if you think that he's expressing disappointment or disapproval, think again or don't think at all. Blind, this blind, it's used uh, it's in, in various ways in, in Zen and in, in different and different koans. Blind, of course, can be just an, this deluded. Uh, in, in Buddhism, it can mean um, the blindness of a heretic who has uh, got the wrong views, like the idea of a permanent self, uh, Atman. It can also mean the blindness uh, after awakening, um, the blindness of the, the uh, attachment to equality, the equality side of the coin, or the no-thingness side of the coin. This is, this is uh, people who have had some degree of awakening and they uh, uh, flout the precepts. After all, the precepts are empty, everything's empty. Uh, why not do what we want? That's a kind of blindness. And then there's the, the blindness the highest one from a Zen perspective, I got this from Roshi and Doksan, is the, the blindness of full enlightenment. Uh, it's beyond uh, one-sidedness of the equality kind of blindness. The blindness of uh, of uh, me, really, another way to understand it is it means empty. Uh, I know it's a bit of a leap from blind to empty, but uh, there's a koan in the Blue Cliff record where the, the two, the master and a monk, are talking about whether the monk's teacher had an open eye, and, and then they talk about giver and receiver, that is, teacher and student, and Hofuku says, uh, Giver and receiver are both blind. One way to understand that is the, the teacher is positive blind this and in a good sense, developed sense, and the student is in the, in the other sense deluded, but uh, then there's this other one. They're both empty, devoid of any abiding self. Which always remember, you know, these words, they can trip us up. It can sound pretty bleak, the negative side of things. But, uh, but really, there's, it, it's only through dying, through endings, through changes. It's only through changes, flux, that the new can arise, that uh, rebirth can happen through death. Well, it's easily said, uh, but practice, it's through practice that we come to really um, take that into our bodies. We really assimilate that and, and know it with a capital K and instead of just intellectually. All right, 
Time is up. We'll stop and recite the four vows.